I'm not too sure if you've delivered any babies yet, but you soon will, or maybe you have delivered your own or somebody's uh, baby that you were close to. Uh, if you have delivered babies and they came out with a heart rate of over 100 and they were crying and fussing and their arms and legs were moving around and they coughed or sneezed when you put a catheter in their nostril and they were pink, then these are babies that have an APGAR score of 10 because they get two points for every one of these five things we mentioned. APGAR is amazingly not only a good acronym to describe these five uh, phenomena, appearance, pulse, grimace, activity, and respiration, but amazingly, it also happens to be the name of the doctor who uh, developed the scale in 1953, Virginia Apgar. Uh, it has been used as the standard, undisputed standard by which we uh, measure newborn health and the uh, APGAR score, which you could see is a maximum of 10 or a minimum of zero, which would be probably stillborn, is the scale by which babies are judged to be healthy. So uh, at some point in time, you won't even have to remember uh, these things because you'll be doing them uh, every single day. Uh, a uh, study, many studies have been uh, done to look at APGAR scores of newborn and relate them not only to mortality but to uh, things further on in life. Uh, basically every APGAR score over a 7 has a almost a 0% uh, mortality uh, in the immediate perinatal period uh, and specifically 28 days as the uh, cutoff point an APGAR score of 0 to 1 has a 50% mortality at 28 days, and usually very, very quickly. And of course, an APGAR score of, uh, let's say, 4 has a 20% mortality. So as you can see, this is a scale relating uh, APGAR score to mortality, but so much more, even things like intelligence and achievement, and there have been a million APGAR studi studies that have been done. Uh, Babies are sterile, uh, perfectly uninfected uh, organisms. They can get infections, though, uh, perinatal, uh, starting out uh, prenatal. They could basically only get them two ways. One of them is through an ascending transcervical infection from the mother, usually uh, due to uh, in, uh, inhalation of infected amniotic fluid, uh, very closely related to a premature rupture of membranes or passes through the, a birth canal during birth. Um, women with herpes is likely to have a C-section for that reason. The only other possible way a baby can become infected, if it wasn't through the transcervical route, it would have to be hematogenous. And as you know, the placenta is the big thing between the mother's blood and the baby's blood. So hematogenous infections are also known as transplacental. Uh, they're mostly viral and parasitic, <coughs> and that's uh, where the name torch comes from, with everything in the torch uh, being a virus other than T, which is toxoplasma, and O, which is other. But rubella, CMV, herpes, those are the transplacental infections. Uh, another virus, uh, uh, parvovirus B19, fifth disease, has a disease uh, called erythema infectiosum, which looks like a real big, puffy, uh, a red in, in infection, which is manifested in cheeks and other places. As another thing, the single biggest bacteria for a transplacental hematogenous infection is Listeria. Remember, it was one of those things that we called a gram-positive rod, and this is the single biggest bacteria uh, infection. Uh, for uh, placental infection for babies. When you look at the development of the baby's lungs, uh, histologically or conceptually or both, you will realize that as the lungs develop and as the air spaces become bigger, there is then a uh, change in ratio between the air cross-sectional area or volume and the uh, stroma or connective tissue 
around it. And as the lung develops, not only do these terminal alveolar sacs get uh, bigger, but the epithelium lining them gets thinner, and the blood vessels grow more in uh, uh, intimately into relationship with these thin uh, alveolar cells, both type 1 and type 2 pneumocytes, with type 1 being the predominant cell. Uh, the thing to remember, however, that in this histologic development, the key factor, the key thing secreted uh, both from the type 2 pneumocytes as well as the clara cells, if you remember the clara cells from the uh, uh, epithelium higher than the respiratory bronchioles, are the uh, is surfactant. So uh, problems with fetal lung uh, maturation are due to inadequate surfactant. That's clearly established. And they produce a disease called neonatal respiratory distress syndrome, RDS. And remember, that is to be di differentiated from adult respiratory distress syndrome, which is completely uh, another disease which we have talked about already and we will talk about some more. RDS is one of the biggest killers of newborns. It's 60,000 cases a year in the USA, uh, 5,000 deaths. Its incidence is inversely proportional to its gestational age. So the more premature a baby is, the more likely it will have RDS. And the single biggest survival problem with prematures is respiratory, and that's all because of lack of surfactant. When the baby takes that first breath, if you've delivered babies, at that point the surfactant is really pumped out in great amounts, and the second breath and breath and the third breath is therefore easier and easier. Without surfactants, every inhalation is like the first one. It's very, very, very difficult to do. What surfactant does is it decreases surface tension such that uh, the babies can uh, breathe better and easier with successive breaths. The uh, three biggest risk factors, one of which we've already gone into for RDS, is prematurity. The more premature, the more problem there's going to be with respiratory surfactant. Um, diabetes independently is another risk factor, and so is a C-section because there's something about the normal delivery process that stimulates surface surfactant secretion. So a C-section is uh, more likely or less likely to produce adequate uh, surfactant. Uh, if you've seen lungs for babies that uh, died uh, of uh, RDS, also known as hyaline membrane disease. They're exactly the same disease. In the old days, it was called hyaline membrane disease, HMD. Now it's called RDS. The basic test we did when we did autopsies on these babies are to take the lungs and put them in water and see if they sink or float. If they sink, that means they didn't have much air in them. And that means the baby never really got a chance to inspire much air because of uh, RDS. If they floated, uh, that was one overall really, really good way to uh, differentiate uh, as a, a quick little test uh, for RDS. Microscopically, and the reason why the disease was called HMD is that when you look at the lungs, there's a relative lack of inflammation. It's, it's not an inflammatory disease. It's uh, even though you will see exudates of fibrin and perhaps some uh, cell debris which line the alveoli, and those are the hyaline membranes. And this is what uh, hyaline membrane disease looks like, or HMD. Look, it's a lung. It's not very well aerated, but you can see some bronchial mucosa here, can't you? You can see some blood vessels. You can see that there's not much cross-sectional air in this lung. This might be something that may not have uh, floated. But in addition, look, look at some of these uh, larger alveoli. We'll go up a little bit further, and look, you have hyalinized or pink eosinophilic material. That's the definition of hyaline, is anything with H&E that is pink and amorphous and acellular and uh, eosinophilic. That's the definition. In this case, hyaline membrane disease are composed of fibrin and also of... Uh, or probably some degenerated uh, cells from the alveoli, some pneumocytes and so forth. 
Uh, we'll go into uh, uh, the next clip very soon. I thank you very much.